Hello class, this is the lecture for 3-6 from the Forrester textbook and I have a big fundamental question for you. This is actually fairly fundamental to all of mathematics and science and it's a huge, huge question that we will not be able to explore all of but I want to get your wheels turning and say why is the universe so predictable? We'll, we'll talk about this next time in class, but people in mathematics are very flustered these days to say mathematics is something that we just invented and even Einstein said why in the world if it's something that we just invented would reality correspond so well to our mathematical ideas. Um, there was a, a famous uh, math mathematician at the start of the 20th century named G.H. Hardy who did number theory and he was an angry atheist and he always said this is a field that has no bearing on reality. I'm doing something that has nothing to do with the real world. It's pure mathematics. Human beings have come up with this and now uh, number theory is the basis for all of e-commerce and online security and is used a million times an hour every hour of every day. So it's, it's not like they're actually able to just come up with math just for the brain. So, so why, why is the universe so predictable? The topic in 3-6 is inverse circular functions. So if you've had a calculator for any number of minutes, you've noticed that there are these inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent buttons on there. How do they work? What are these for? What do they do? And first of all, I thought we should ask something very real world. Now this is not math that you're going to be responsible for, but it is something more tangible. So we had the in opening graphic of the planets circulating around the sun. Here's an, another question like that, something that you're not really able to do quite yet, but you will be in not too long. So the question is, what if low tide was every nine hours? How would you use that then to be able to predict when you're going to be able to go to the beach and get cool shells? How often is uh, low tide, how does that correspond then, how does that intersect with human life? Our 24-hour life that we live and nine out, something happening every nine hours, how do those two get together. So pause the video, think about that, we'll come back to that in just a second. What if low tide was every nine hours? Well, nine is made out of three and three versus our lives that we live are based off of 24, which is three and two and two and two, or three times eight that that's the, the, the breakdown of how our two systems uh, are made, made out of multiplication speaking. So the least common multiple between those two uh, is what you needed to be figuring out and that would tell you that there would be eight low tides every three days. So if you wanted to see a picture of that and how this relates to trig and the chapter that we're in, here are those two functions in the uh, the dotted is the low tide every nine hours, and the uh, gray is, no, the vice versa, that the dotted is the days and the gray is the tides. And I tried to have low tide and midnight uh, be at the bottom of the graph. Now, again, this is something more complicated than you're able to deal with yet. But I hope you can see the usefulness of trigonometry, that things that come in cycles, days with light and dark and tides, moon phases, um, anything that comes and goes in a periodic way, all this stuff about periodic functions describes uh, how they intersect in multiple waves getting together. So let's do one that you can actually do. Instead of having two trig functions running into each other, very complicated, let's just have a trig function and a line. That's something that you can handle. So if you watched the uh, Fruit Ninja video, then you know that sine is talking about the y value on the unit circle and asking when the y value, when does sine equal a half. You can see that that's going to happen an infinite number of times along our graph, 
but it is something that we can sort of answer in the first quadrant, answer in the second quadrant, and then use that expansively over and over and over again to account for all possibilities. This is dependent then upon the period. It happens again every period later, uh, but the, you have to get the sort of original answers and then just extrapolate that out, write that for any number more of cycles. And it's a very predictable, understandable pattern. So here comes one that's a lot more uh, difficult and of the kind that we need to work up to in section 3-6. What if we have this insane cosine function, 9 plus 7 cos 2 pi 13 uh, x minus 4, how, where are all the places where this intersects with the line y equals 5? So a very, very reasonable, sensible answer is to get out your calculator, put in the line y equals 5, put in the line y2 equals 9 plus 7 cos 2 pi 13 x minus 4, and just do intersect. Find out where those uh, intersections are, and then, oh, but wait. How often will that occur? Now normally, cosine would have a period of 2 pi, but we've multiplied inside our uh, cosine x part, we've multiplied by 2 pi thirteenths. So the period is not going to be the same as it would normally be. So it's certainly, you can, you can eyeball this graphically. Here's a picture of what that would look like in your calculator. And you can sort of eyeball where that would be. You can use your calculator then to come up with the numerical data. But you're still going to have to do a bit of algebra to figure out what is the period. How, if I get those points where they intersect, how often do they come up so that I can be able to describe the infinite number of solutions that are going on here? So, let's do the algebra. If we've got these two equations equal to each other, then the first easiest, most natural thing to do is to subtract 9 from both sides. That getting rid of that number is the easiest. This is part of why I'm doing this is that this looks ginormous and scary and there's all these numbers there but just like you are able to solve regular algebra problems that say x minus 3 parentheses divided by 2 equals 7 that you 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 have a process in your mind for how to deal with those you you get rid of the multiplying parts and then you get rid of the adding parts and you're, you 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 would know how to proceed through that problem the only thing that's freaking you out about this one is that there's a pi in there and there's a cosine in there. But just like all the regular algebra that you've learned up to this point, you know how to peel off a bit at a time. So there, the obvious bit was to peel off the, the 9, subtract that from both sides. What's the next obvious thing to go for? Divide by 7. That that's going to be a real easy way to, to get it down to the next simplest level. Now, here's the part that's why this is, gets its own section in the textbook. Getting rid of cosine. So, so when we wanted to get rid of 9, when we wanted to get rid of adding 9, we subtracted 9. We wanted to get rid of multiplying by 7, we divided by 7. What's the opposite of taking the cosine? The opposite of taking the cosine is taking the arc cosine. So that if we take the arc cosine of both sides, then that'll get rid of the cosine on the left and move an arc cosine over to the right. Okay? So that's the big leap, the hurdle, that we'll practice in class if you don't feel comfortable with that. But I hope you can see the opposite of cosine is inverse cosine, arc cosine. We divide by uh, 2 pi thirteenths, which is the same as multiplying by 13 2 pi. And lastly, we, we've almost got x alone. We just need to add 4. So we've moved things around. X, look up at the top there and how x was just buried inside all those parentheses. We peeled off layer after layer after layer, and now we have the exact definition of x alone. That this thing that you've been doing now for a few years of solve for x, which is just fancy math talk for saying get x alone, you can now do that with trig functions. 
exciting stuff. So this is the exact answer, right? I mean, like there's always decimals that we can get from the intersect feature on our calculator, but if we need the exact answer for unflinching accuracy, this is it. This also then helps us see how we could use that decimal answer from our calculator and extrapolate out the period of this. We, we need to, I'll put this in faded because uh, you need to just sort of recognize this happens over and over and over again. Normally that would be 2 pi k over and over again, uh, plus or minus, because cosine, it works left or right. Uh, but uh, the, the more useful thing is to recognize that the period of this one is 13. That if the period of cosine is normally 2 pi and we've multiplied inside our cosine function by 2 pi over 13, 2 pi divided by 2 pi over 13 is 13. Every 13 units, this pattern repeats over and over again. So if I, if I go back, you can see on this graph, uh, look at like, 4, 16, and then 17, 16, you can see that the pattern repeats every 13 units. So that's what the point of doing all that algebra was uh, to get the exact answer and to get the period. So we will practice that in class, and I will see you next time we get together. Have a great day.